thank you everyone for being here and especially to the organizers for inviting me. It's a great pleasure. I'm going to, um, yes, no, it, it was already there. I'm going to be talking about um, <clears throat> use of positive appeals today. And I came here rather thinking this would be a bit of a controversial topic. But everybody I've spoken to today uh, since I arrived um, actually agrees with me. So I'm hoping that I'm just preaching to the converted and you'll all just uh, say yes, absolutely. I don't know why you're even bothering to say it anymore. Because that would be wonderful. So I'm really going to take us on a bit of a journey. Not quite um, as exciting a journey as Jay's, I'm afraid. It's very linear, this presentation. Um, from thread appeals, um, looking at a bit of data, asking you to actually tune into some feelings, using a bit of story, and hopefully to come to a point where we can ask the question, what is the cumulative effect of using so many negative appeals in social marketing? And should we really be looking at more positive uh, strategies? The first words you would have found on the website, which I was so delighted to see, engage, empower, and inspire. I think that's a really good you know, um, overarching strategy for social marketers. And is that what you as social marketer practitioners or researchers have at the back of your mind whenever you set out to develop a strategy? I think it would be great if that's at least how we set out. Um, I think along the way, sometimes that gets a bit lost in the development of actual uh, strategies. And certainly as a consumer of social marketing, I feel more often disempowered, disengaged, depressed, and sometimes almost expired. <laughs> um, I saw a, a, a health um, campaign for wearing sunglasses in Western Australia. And not only did you have to wear sunglasses to protect your eyes from all the dangers of the sun, but you also had to wear particular sunglasses that had a special thing about them. And this is my field, this is my field I love, this is what I'm passionate about, this is, you know, I, I'm always interested when I see a new campaign come out. But this particular one just finished me off. I just had had enough, and I just said, no, I don't care whether my sunglasses have that special thing or not, and I never did find out. It was as if I'd reached saturation point. It was the straw that broke the camel's back. I just could not absorb one more thing I had to do, you know? I'd already given up smoking, and that was hard. <laughs> and I was already walking every day, and that's not easy. <laughs> and, you know, yes, I've even been dieting and, you know, and eating healthy foods. What more do I have to do? And I feel like that is really what we, we sometimes, you know, convey to people. So just very, very briefly, negative versus positive, what do we mean? Well, there's all sorts of ways of defining it. And I think probably the simplest way is the pornography definition. You know, you know it when you see it. Um, but one good way, I think, is to look at motivations. <clears throat> we want to motivate people to change. So yes, we want to look at motivations that will move them into change. And certainly avoiding a problem is a good motivation and people will say that that is what they want to do and fear is the appropriate motivation if what you're trying to do is motivate people to avoid a problem and that's I think why we have been locked into so much negative um, work in social marketing but we can also appeal to positive motivations you know we don't try to change children's behavior by constantly yelling at them and saying don't do that don't do that well, maybe we do. I don't know. I don't have children. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but, you know, I understand that it's much more effective if you can encourage and persuade, inspire children to do differently. And there are many positive motivations that are appropriate to social marketing, including a sense of mastery over my environment, a sense of being able to control what I do and how I um, manage myself in the world. Uh, social and self-approval, very strong motivators. And all of these would have emotions such as um, pride, confidence, um, 
a sense of belonging. These are really powerful motivators as well, and we don't use them nearly enough. <clears throat> a lot of people have been telling me that, yes, all the research says positive is better, but actually, I haven't really seen that much in the literature. Um, my understanding of the scientific literature in the journals is that really fear just keeps coming out ahead. Despite 70 years of people like me actually trying to persuade, uh, to trying to find the opposite. A lot of the literature is about low versus high fear. <clears throat> so the assumption almost is, okay, well, if you're going to use fear, which obviously you're going to do, um, shall we use really high fear? Because that's kind of like what we'd like to do. Um, and I haven't found very much research at all in the literature on using positive motivations instead, and very little comparing, okay, if you, know, you use fear, what's the response here, and what's the effect if you use a positive motivation? There's great PhDs in this for anyone who's looking for one. Um, so is more fear more effective? This is the, um, one of the theories is that yes, you just keep getting more and more effective. And surprisingly enough to me, that is what the research generally shows. There's only a few anomalous studies that show the competing theory, which is that surely there's a point at which fear is just too strong for us, and we can't take any more, like me. And we, our, the effectiveness of the message drops off because we have um, maladaptive responses to it. So is more fear more effective? Well, yeah, I think actually, probably. Uh, particularly if you've got high efficacy. Efficacy is, in fact, about empowering people. And so in terms of our engage, empower, and inspire, you know, we are onto something here with social marketing. <clears throat> efficacy comes in two kinds. <laughs> the belief that I can perform the action and the belief that if I do, the, it's going to work, it's going to have an effect, it's going to be useful to me. <clears throat> We did a study, quite a, sh a small study, but looking at people who recycle and people who don't. And some of our groups were absolutely fanatical recyclers. And we were trying to see what's the difference between these people. And the difference absolutely came down to just one thing, nothing to do with how committed they were to the environment or anything else, but it was the belief that individuals recycling, reusing and reducing would make a difference. So that's a response efficacy. People who don't recycle, in these groups anyway, just didn't believe that their drop in the bucket would make any difference. The people who did believe that their drop in the bucket was another drop in the bucket. And actually, they both, all the people used that phrase, drop in the bucket. They just had different sides of the coin for it. <clears throat> we did a study on physical activity and asked people, you know, what's the benefit of physical activity? 99.5%, there's always one, isn't there? said, health, it's good for your health. So they all knew that. So then we asked them to name one specific health benefit. Now, I'm sure that if I asked you all that, you would know, because we know, don't we? We do it. But over half of the people could not name a single health benefit of being physically active. They were much better at naming the risks even though the risks and the benefits are, you know, just two sides of the same coin. So again, response efficacy, they just don't know what it will do for them if they do it. If you don't have high response efficacy as well as self-efficacy, um, you're not going to get a, a good response. People aren't going to do it. So I think another, and in fact in Western Australia we really are addressing this now. So instead of just saying it's easy, you can do it, it's only 30 minutes a day, it's not a big exercise, all of those messages we've been putting out for a long time, we're actually saying what it does for you as well. <clears throat> okay, that's talking a bit about empowerment. I'll just go back again to look at the low versus high fear stuff. One good news about um, using less fear is that it's less expensive. We looked at some very... Um, shocking, horrific, high production value uh, road safety ads from the state of Victoria. And 
they were costing a huge amount to produce. And people were saying, I can't watch that, I have to turn it off. As soon as it starts, I just turn that over the channel. So we were looking to see, well, are they effective or not? And it's true, the best two ads were um, the expensive ones. <clears throat> but there was one little kind of um, information sort of ad that only cost $10,000 to make, which performed almost as well as this very expensive $275,000 courtroom ad. So there's more to it than just um, pouring money into it as well. Now this is, this is my first study, this is my PhD. It goes back a long way, of course, but I still think that this is where my um, conviction came from. Now I don't know if you'll be able to see it, especially at the back, but <clears throat> we've got, um, we're graphing different threats against the effectiveness of the, res of the message, the response. The solid line is males, 40 to 50 smokers, and the, fem uh, the dotted line is female smokers, 40 to 50 years old. Um, I suppose the first thing you can see, even if you're at the back, is that men and women are different. <laughs> uh, absurdly different. And And, and really just the astonishing thing is that the males responded least as they should, as we were expecting, to the non-death control, which was just an information-only message. That's the one second from the right. Whereas the women responded best to that. So they responded best to the message that had no threats in it at all. It just told them what emphysema was, how it worked. So I'm not here to say positive appeals are better, and I'm not even here to say you should use them you know, for everybody, because clearly people do respond differently. But it does make me wonder about who's deciding on so many of these death threats that we have in our society these days. You know, you're gonna die of just about everything. You're gonna die of speeding, you're gonna die of lung cancer, you're gonna die of whatever else. My theory for this <clears throat> thesis was that, um, well, you're gonna die anyway. So, so how good a threat is that? You know, surely we, just, surely we just deny those threats. So it was amazing to me that people don't. See, the men respond very well to death threats. Um, <laughs> you might remember that. <laughs> And in fact, they respond best of all, that highest point on the solid line, is to threats of dying horribly. <laughs> <laughs> but women didn't respond to death threats at all. The threats were just death, you're gonna die of it. Uh, death control. Um, death, you're gonna die horribly. The next one is you're gonna miss out on your grandchildren and you know, the rest of your life. And the next one was, your death will affect your loved ones. So the only one that women responded to of those death threats, you can see the dotted line lifted for the death effect on loved ones. Okay. <clears throat> oh, here was another one. We were looking at nutrition and physical activity and asked people their motivations. What motivates you to be more active, eat healthy foods? And the first motivation was to avoid illness. So yes, that is the negative emotion fear uh, motivator. But the next two were so I can feel better about myself and to have a better life. And those are the positive motivations. So even if they didn't come number one, you know, they still are up there, they can still be effective. And then in the quantitative part of this, <laughs> it's rather surprised me that um, guilt was the most effective uh, predictor of of um, intention to change. So, you know, guilt is another powerful emotion. I should do it. Um, but also another negative emotion. <clears throat> the second one was positivity. A positive attitude to change was actually the second most effective. So I'm not saying fear isn't powerful. I'm just saying that, you know, the positive are up there as well. 
In terms of engagement, this was a study that we did in Mandurah, a small community south of Perth. And um, it was funded by the Stronger Communities Fund of the federal government. So the whole point was that we had to engage the community in an issue. The um, issue was bullying and the community was not very, um, they were very interested in it, they were very concerned about it, but they didn't think that anything could be done about it. And we started off with a fairly negative sort of consequence-based um, approach. I won't go through it all because I'm short of time already. Uh, but then we got the engagement from this one. No one's born to bully, if you can't read it there at the back. And suddenly everybody was on side and we had a terrific response. At this point, I just want to question the assumption that what shows up in our research as most effective may still not be the best choice for us. And maybe we should at this point be thinking about what is the cumulative effect of all these negative appeals? Let's just watch something and you can tell me how you feel at the end of it. How do you feel on a scale of one to ten? If you feel over six, can you wave your hand? Oh good, I've got quite a few waving hands. Not as many as I was expecting, to be honest. <laughs> Thank you for the late comments there. <laughs> um, this was a positive parenting campaign that was run in Western Australia a while ago. And for some reason, I was then going to show you a really powerful negative campaign that was run in New Zealand. And I woke up this morning and I thought, why would I do that? Why would I, you know, especially given my topic, why would I want to make them feel bad? So I'm gonna, not gonna watch that, I hope. <laughs> oh no, no, it's showing, there we go. <laughs> okay, well, this is my big question. I don't know if there's a damaging cumulative effect of using fear, but I do know that we have a, an epidemic of depression. We know that Depression is associated with helplessness from Martin Seligman's seminal work. And that helplessness can easily be fueled by fear, like with my sunglasses. And this is the really big thing. So if you don't remember anything else that I've said, if you can just take this one thing away. It's the enormous paradox that we have in social marketing that we're trying a lot of the time to reduce anxiety, alleviating behaviors. Things like smoking, things like... Um, uh, uh, overeating, drugs, and so on. These are anxiety alleviating behaviors. And so what is the paradox here that we decide to use anxiety to try to alleviate them? <clears throat> First, we must do no harm. That's really important. I have a lovely doctor story, but I haven't got enough time unless somebody asks me to tell you in the questions. Um, <laughs> um, so let me just end with what I hoped would be absolutely brand new to all of you. And then I spoke to someone yesterday and he said, oh, it's gone viral. This is, a, this is an ad that came out in Western Australia just literally within the last two weeks. And I brought it along to show you. I'm not going to tell you where, which office it's from. And I'd just like you to think about the approach that they're using. Oops, I'll skip that. That's as part of the doctor story. So here we go. Thanks. 
sexual dysfunctionality, diabetes, health condition, depression, anxiety, muscular pain, and the worst of all names too much right now. But when we slow down, we discover that life has a natural pace. And that's good. We slow down. a nice road safety ad, do you think? Um, just, oh, sorry, just to <laughs> end, um, it is complicated what we do, but I really like the idea of having behind us this, this sense of engage, empower and inspire. And as I heard Jared Hastings say in Perth just last year, you know, we have the best product to sell. We have life. We have longer life quality of life, happiness. These are really good things to be selling. And uh, I think that we can probably do it a lot better with those positive motivations than we have been. Thanks very much. Thank you very, thank you very much, Nadine. I think we're really touching on the true benefits here of social marketing. and. It's touching a, a nerve in my, uh, my area as well with the, uh, I mean, the biggest fear amongst yeah. people with arthritis yeah. is the more they exercise, the worse their arthritis mm -hmm. will get. And mm -hmm. in fact, all the research coming out of the US and Australia is it actually slows down the onset mm -hmm. of arthritis. So we, we have some major behavior changes in our area. Can I just take one, one question to start with anyway? We've got one at the back here. If you could just state your name and my name is Ron Organization. Patrick. I'm uh, Marketing Mix Egypt. Um, I've been doing commercial marketing for the past 22 years, and I see that maybe what we can apply here is um, the problem-solution approach, which is a mix of fear and positivity at the same time. I, this is how I see it. I don't have much experience with social marketing, but uh, with commercial marketing, this has been working very yes. well. So I'd like to know your opinion about that. Yes, thank you. Um, and I think that's probably what they did in the Enjoy the Ride uh, uh, campaign is that they have said there are problems, you know, that the stress can cause problems. I'm struck by how much more positive commercial marketing is. I saw a, um, a quit ad by one of the patch companies and it was so positive. <laughs> and I thought, wow, this is a quit smoking ad, you know, <laughs> we don't do this. And yet they, they're trying to sell a product and they do do that. So yes, I agree. I think that it's a, um, a definite way to go. Have we any questions on the wings? We've got, we've got one on the front row here. And then I think we're going to have to move on, folks. Yes. 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 Sorry, can you, do, can you just wait till the mic comes <laughs> to, for the, everybody's benefit? Thanks a lot. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a consultant, consultant, and journalist. 
You mentioned there were a couple of road safety ads, and there was the 275,000 quarter, yeah. quarter one, and you mentioned the 10,000 one. What was the difference with the 10,000 one if it was, you know, almost as good? Oh, well, it just didn't have... 260. Yes, it didn't have the car crash, it didn't have the um, extreme powerful ads. I don't know if you've seen the ads that came out of... Well, I was also going to show some of those and I thought, no, no, this is really not what I want to do. <laughs> they were very, very powerful. Um, but I can't remember exactly what the 10,001 did, but it was just... I think it was just text, really, as far as... No, they were... They were it was still negative, yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks very much, and I'm happy to... Thank you, thank you Nadine.